I'll be focusing a bit on issues of different types of data and their sources, which will um, or shape the way that you can analyze it, the kinds of things you can do with it, the kinds of charts and, and statistics you can do on them. Do we have any Star Trek Next Generation fans here who get this? It's a very subtle joke. It's data, of course you know. That's the creator of data. That's the data source. <coughs> hey, not a Star Trek crowd. Um, looking around for information on this, I came across this very concise definition of data type, which is an actual, it's, it's not the, it's not the, um, defining each word, but the concept of data type. A particular kind of data item as defined by the values it can take, the programming language used, or the operations that can be performed on it. And that pretty much sums it up. Thank you. Next. Oh, go on. No, but it's very, very much about what we're going to look at, the kind of values and, and, or programming as well as operations. Um, again, like I found myself doing yesterday, we're kind of dividing this into two perspectives, a social science perspective and a computing perspective. So in social sciences, they talk about data types with such terms as, or such distinctions as primary versus secondary. So primary data sources, when you're going out and collecting it, you're, the, you know, you're doing it specifically <coughs> for the analysis, for the research you have. Whereas the secondary is you're making use of something that already exists. My life is generally built around secondary data sources. Uh, university information systems, national data systems, and so on. Uh, but I certainly get involved in pro some primary sources, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the other major distinction is quantitative and qualitative. Uh, we tend to think that we can do most of our analyses on quantitative data, but I hope you will uh, get a sense after this that, no, there's lots of ways to analyze qualitative data, which you probably know already, but we'll extend that hopefully a little bit. Um, the, the area of folk, one of the main area of focus is what I'll talk about, and it's not going to be that long a talk, is levels of measurement. Levels of measurement is the crux of what can you do with the data depending on what values it takes. Um, and so, you know, like having gender, which is a certain kind of variable, a certain level, and you have male and female, you cannot do an average. You can, but it would sound pretty foolish to have the average person in black, somewhere between. Um, and what is that last one about? What about the contextual achiever process perception? I forget why I put that line in, actually. But maybe we'll get back to that. Computer and information sciences thinks of data types differently. They use different types of types, which have to do with how it is processed within the software and the hardware. So uh, these, another thing to note, I am, these terms I am using are not universally standard. If you had someone else talking to you about this, they might use a different set of labels for these, or they might use different categories. It's, uh, there are a lot of ways to, to describe this. But basically, there is sort of the elemental data, the data that um, are the specific, uh, the atoms. You cannot, well, you can't break atoms down further, but in this case, they're the atoms that cannot be broken down further. Okay, so the, the most primitive stuff, the, the things on which you create on top of them, um, and there are different types of them as, as you know, technical purposes, things. They have to represent different kinds of numbers in different ways, depending on whether they're whole numbers or whether they're fractional numbers and continuous and so on. And then there's a set that are put together, sort of the molecules, where there is the next level up. Um, these are sometimes called enumerated data, but there are other <coughs> names for them. And that includes what's known as an array, you know, a sequence of numbers, and a vector or a matrix. Um, that's one type, of, you know, one type of derived data, but also a record that contains uh, I, different columns, different attributes, or different fields of data. That's also considered a form of data, but it's higher level because it's structured in a certain way. And then even strings and text are considered enumerated because they're made up of characters. So just to 
way they think, you know, use that. And I'm not a computer scientist, so um, Ron Deere or others can tell you why it's important to do that. Also, we have certain kind of uh, what we call user-defined data, and those take the form of pointers and references. Are pointers and references still used in computer science programming, or is that kind of old hat? No, still, still, still good. So I remember in the old-fashioned programming, you had to actually tell the computer where to look for the next piece of data <coughs> once it finished with one piece of data. So you had pointers, or an end-of-file marker, or end-of-line marker is, is a pointer of sorts. And then function types having to do with how the, the pr procedures you create to manipulate data. Then you get into the more um, applied. OK. Then you get into the more applied types of data uh, that often are associated with specific fields. But here I'm doing sort of more general ones. Like with, when we're talking about data that's captured by an organization within their information systems, management information systems, they'll refer to such things as structured data versus semi-structured and unstructured data. Uh, structured data is, as you can imagine, the kind of uh, file that you're thinking of, that you usually think of with analysis, where there are certain characteristics of each column that describe whether it's about defining the record or it's an attribute of whatever the record is defined as. Um, then we t well, I'll talk a little bit about this second kind because it's important for the type of analysis we do, the transa tra transactional versus analytical and master types, and it's mainly the transaction and analytical distinction that's important for our work. Um, now we're getting much more into the uh, disciplinary-based or areas. So spatial data is represented as in differently than other types of data. Uh, first, there's the sort of places, the vectors, the points, lines, and connectors, uh, distance between two points, uh, the polygons are the areas. But then there's also these raster data, which tell you about features of the area. So imagine a top topographical map, and it's showing you that the elevation is high here, lower here. That's more feature data represented by raster types of data. And then, when you get into various disciplines, there are quirks, specific quirks to the reasons they need to make distinctions about types of data for the types of analysis they do. So there's plenty of types to be concerned with, but really for our work, um, we're going to focus more on those social science distinctions like quantitative versus qualitative. And again, we'll load these slides when we're done. There's a nice little... Um, I find it. I'm always going back to this one. The social science, social research methods science has a lot of good information on it uh, to go back to. So the big distinction, the quantitative versus qualitative, is really numerical versus not numerical, basically. Um, but even though they're distinguished as being different, quantitative data are based on qualitative judgments. I mean, this has more high-level judgment things like self-esteem scale and grades. Grades are based on a judgment of the faculty member, based on exams and assessments or whatever else you include in your grades. But even when you think of things like gender, okay, we have a firm biological basis to that, but, and maybe, I'm not a biologist, so maybe it's not that firm, I don't know for sure, but certainly these days gender identity is something that's a lot less clear than is a binary distinction. Race. Now, it's interesting to consider the way race is conceived in South Africa as compared to what it's conceived of in the United States. So you know all about your local racial distinctions, where they come from, how they've been made. In the US, it's much more confusing because we have, um, we distinguish multiracial people a lot more, in a lot different ways. Um, we have these set of odd trumping rules. So for example, if you're not a US citizen or a resident alien, it doesn't matter what your race is, you're called a foreigner. Non-resident alien is the official government term for it. That's trumping rule one. Trumping rule two is, are you Hispanic? If you are, then you're Hispanic. Then if you're not foreign or Hispanic, you get to check off all that apply between uh, white, African-American, Asian-American, 
Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, Alaskan Native or American Indian, Alaskan Native. Yeah, those are the those are the government's five, the national government's five, and you can check more than one of them off. So if you check more than one and you're not Hispanic and you're not foreign, you're multiracial. And if you check only one, you're that. We keep the data in both ways so we could use it, but it's, it's a very much a political construct that always has something to do with the racial, you know, with the history, the legacy. Um, I, a couple, if you talk to an anthropologist and biologist about the concept of race, you find out it's not really a real thing. It's something that is actually made up for all sorts of reasons. Anyway, so there's tons of qualitative judgments in quantitative data, and, and that's often overlooked. We just take it for granted that that number represents something real and concrete, and it often doesn't, especially when we're looking at things like behavior in higher education institutions and in hospitals and all those things. It's very, very um, imprecise in certain ways. Qualitative data, similarly, can be described and manipulated numerically. So when we do a, um, a, an analysis of qualitative data, and again, not my area of expertise, but we're generally looking for themes that come out of the data, and we recognize things like the valence of, of feeling, the sentiment of people, um, their engagement. I did one qualitative study I was involved in where we watched children play with amusement park games, and we coded their affect, their time, and so on. So we were turning this into numeric data. Psychologists do that all the time with scale, self-esteem scales and things like that. We, we ask a set of Likert questions, and we, on that basis, we create a measure. So even though it seems like it's a good distinction, there's a lot that's uh, behind it. We also have now a whole new range of uh, text data mining or text mining tools. Has anyone used some text mining tools? Which one was it? I used uh, Zotero. Zotero. Okay, so those are more like citation systems. Um, I've used the SPSS and the SAS text miners. And um, I, it's complicated. I, I didn't get, it didn't, you really have to spend time with these things because it involves creating a dictionary that's related to the, your area that you're looking at and lexicon and all those things, but it's, it's definitely becoming a much bigger thing. So these different types of data are again related to different types of um, structures and that's illustrated in, in the computer side uh, in terms of the way they distinguish the built-in from the user-defined structures and they distinguish the different types which have to do with the way data is represented and stored. But I want to focus most of this time on the issue of how the characteristics of the fields, the variables you're using, relates to what you can do with those variables. Um, and We'll, we'll use some basic concepts, so any of you who have taken basic statistics courses, this is probably just a refresher at best. Those are the four distinctions we make about type of variables, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And it determines what kind of statistics we can do on them. So, whoa, what happened to nominal? Oh, I missed nominal. Oh, well. I'm missing my nominal slide. Nominal is simply, as it sounds, names, categories. You can just say, this category is different from this category, but you can't really say in what way, except they are different. Gender, male and female. Race, another categorical variable. What's important is there's no order to them. Now, if you want to be a wise person, you would say, well, anytime something's binary, there's always an order to them, but we'll leave that aside. That's a special type of variable. But anytime you have more than two categories, you cannot say the order. It doesn't matter whether you do African colored Indian white, because that's alphabetical, or African Indian colored white, because that's numerically the way they happen in terms of numbers of people, or white color. It can do anything. There's no inherent distinction between which is put first and last. 
otherwise, it, if there is a reason for it, it's not based on the data or the science of it. With ordinal, you add one characteristic, that there is something that says this comes before this, which comes before this. But you can't say any meaning about the, the distance between them. So when you say it's typical Likert scale, strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. Is the difference between strongly agree and agree the same as the distance between agree and neutral? Is it, you know, and is it the same for different people? There's just nothing inherent in them that puts any information in the order. Intervals, you now have meaningful differences. So when you're counting age, well, that's actually an interval ratio. Temperature, that's an ordinal variable, but it's not, it doesn't have, it, it has one degree to two degree to three degrees, has a specific meaning in terms of something. Now, it may not have it in terms of how it feels to you, but it does in terms of um, molecular action, things like that calories and all of that, there's a precise difference between a degree. But the thing with an interval scale is you have no meaningful zero. Now, okay, Kelvin scale has a meaningful zero, but for Celsius and Fahrenheit, it's arbitrary. In fact, they're different. Um, this also is something like a matric score is often an interval. It depends how the matric score is made. But basically, for a standardized test score, the meaning of the interval is the percentage of people is always the same between 0 and 1 and 1 and 2 and 2 and 3. That's how they're defined by virtue of percentiles in some fashion. And then finally, ratio, that's where you've got everything. You've got the 0, you've got the meaningful interval, and so on. And with 0, you can express magnitude. You can't express magnitude with an interval. So you cannot say 20 degrees is twice as hot as 10 degrees. It doesn't really mean that. Because then 10 degrees is infinitely hotter than 0 degrees. So it just doesn't have that meaning and that's why you can't do certain things with it. Although actually when it comes to statistics, interval and ratio we treat the same way. Okay, so weight, what's that? Interval ratio. Ratio. Zero means something. And being weighing 20 kilos is weighing twice as much as 10 kilos. They'll actually, just, if you take two 10 kilo things, put it on a scale, it'll be the same as 20 kilos. So that's, mag, that's where magnitude comes in. IQ. IQ is an interval scale, there's, there's a percentile meaning of the difference between IQ levels. I think the average is 100 and the standard deviation is 20, so you can infer where a person is in the percentile of the distribution with the numbers. So anyway, what you're seeing then is this is a hierarchy of, of scales that starts with just simply distinguishing categories, putting order between values, making the distance between the values equal, and then adding a meaningful zero. And that's what distinguishes these types of variables. Most importantly for us, what does that mean in terms of what kind of statistics we can do on them? What kind of analyses we can do on them? Well, generally speaking, there are statistics that are based for nominal, ordinal, or interval ratio. And there are measures, and if you use a statistic on the same level or lower, you're okay but you can't use it on a higher level variable. So you shouldn't be using a interval ratio statistic on a nominal or even an ordinal variable. And that's where we get a little flaky, is when we do it on the ordinal ones. Have you ever seen people doing averages on Likert items? I have. On a five-point scale on the average response, oh, oh, course evaluations. You do it all the time, right? You have a five-point scale, you have a 4.2 is your average. It's not actually kosher because it doesn't have meaningful intervals, but that doesn't stop us. So if you do a higher, a higher order statistic on a lower order thing, you generally lose information. Or I'm sorry, on a higher order 
value. You lose information, you're not using the full information. And if you do a higher order statistic on a lower order variable, that's, that's no good. The buzzers go off. So let's, get, uh, let's do one more concept and then we'll go on. We'll give you the examples. Um, the other way to distinguish variables is discrete versus continuous. Discrete means you have bins and nothing between them. One, two, three, but you can't be 1.5, you can't be 2.9, like counts. Counts are discrete. Measures like height and weight, continuous, because you can get as far as you want to go in, in accuracy. And the only repercussion for this, really, to think about is in a bar graph. When your number is continuous, you should have your bars touching. And when it's discrete, there should be a space between your bars to show that. Do people do that? Not all the time. But that's really the only thing, is that you can have those smooth curves and lines with attached lines, which people tend to do for other things. But technically, you shouldn't. So here's the relationship between the basic kind of relate, the, the, the type of um, analysis we can do depending on the type of variable. So when we have normal, norm, nominal and ordinal, we generally can only do cross-tab tables. A table, here's one variable, gender, here's another variable, race, and here's the number in each cell. That's a cross-tab. Anyone remember what statistic you use with cross-tabs to see if the difference is if the distribution of one across the other is independent or dependent? Oh, I heard it, I heard it. Chi-square, chi yes. That's what your chi-square statistic is for. And there are several other statistics you can do with that. And so the difference, whether you have order or non-ordered, you can use some additional diagnostic statistics like uh, phi coefficients and other measures of association between the two variables. If you've got one nominal, variable and the continue and our interval ratio, that's where the nominal is defining your groups and you look at the mean differences on the continuous variable. What's the average difference on weighted marks between males and females? So that's where the group differences come in. And finally, when you're both interval ratio, then you can use correlation. Now when you get to things like regression, it's generally in the interval ratio area with the exception that you can throw in dichotomous binary variables. They allow you to do that because they have that inherent property that there is an order, but it's arbitrary which is up and which is down. Whether you code females as zero and males as one or males as zero and females as one, that's arbitrary, but you can act actually get meaning, and I'll show you that in a second. So here, these are actual UKZN data that were given to me for the previous class we taught. And I think this is about 2012 or so. And this is only in three-year programs. This is the enrollment in three-year programs as of that time. So you look at the numbers and you see, okay, I generally have more female than male and that appears to hold up except in the colored when you're looking at the numbers. But then you always go to percentages and the whole, it's always difficult to know, do I do row percentages or do I do column percentages? And they each tell a different story, and you can't know beforehand which story is the one you want to tell. So you usually do one, then the other. I, I generally suggest not doing both for, ex, for dissemination because it can be confusing to try and figure out which way one is talking. You could do the table both ways, but generally you look at it yourself, you look at both. <laughs> So let's look at the table at the lower left. What does it tell you? You see anything there worth noting? Do you think the distribution of females over race is the same as the distribution of males over race, yes or no? If you ran a chi-square statistics, do you think this one would be statistically significant? I'm, I'm thinking no. It depends, it depends how much data you have, because the more data you have, the more you can get a small result being significant. So, so it's really based on the numbers. But when I look at that 1% difference, 2, 1, 0, that's not really different. You pretty much have the same distribution of across race within the genders. Do you have the same distribution across gender within the races? 
No, there's actually a pretty large difference. You have Indians and coloreds being more predominant, and, and Africans. So these three groups tend to be 60-40, female-male, whereas this group is 50-50. So the same data cast in different ways actually gives you a different story. And the story in this case is in this view of it, the, co the row percentages. The gender distribution is different across races, but the race distribution is not different across genders. These are the ways we tend to graphically show the same relationship. And again, we can do it vertically or horizontally. No, nothing sacred about either one. They're fine. Whatever works better for you. How, notice the way I ordered race. African, Indian, white, and colored. That's probably not the way you usually see it. But why did I do that? Because in terms of prevalence most to least. And you can do that with nominal because order is not important. So when you're doing work with nominal variables, it's generally good to do it. To, it not, sometimes if there's just, this is the way we always look at it. These are the ways we talk about our colleges in this order. Then people get used to it. But if not, you want to use something like a feature that is described by the data to determine which is top, which is next, and so on. What you're seeing here and here is the which is within what. This is race within gender. I'm sorry, this is gender within race. This is race within gender. Which one is right? Which one looks better? Which one gets the point across? That's all that matters with this kind of analysis. OK. Now a little tricky one. I, I really wanted to try and make this, uh, get the bottoms to align with the top and be about the same data, but it was too late last night, so I didn't do that. <laughs> the top one shows you the average entry matric points by race and gender. And on the left is the average, on the right is the standard deviation. So, you know, we look to the average first and say, okay, well, it looks like the white and color generally are higher on average than the African and the Indian, which are a little closer, and so on. Males, females, doesn't look like there's any difference going on there. Now, when we show it graphically, this, what we're trying to show is whether the distribution of values differ. So we tend to use something of this form called the box and whisker plot, where the box is the middle 50th percentile of the data, from the 25th to the 75th. The hatch mark is, is the median. And the whiskers go out to either the maximum or minimum, or sometimes the fifth percentile and 95th percentile. There are differences in how people do this. Because if there's outliers, they don't necessarily. Sometimes they'll put the outliers as an asterisk beyond where the whisker goes. Sometimes people like little end bars on their whiskers. But what you see here is, it, this is, by the way, the percentage of degrees conferred in different schools at my university, or different groups of schools. The business school with communication thrown in, education, humanities and fine arts, life and health sciences and services, public and human professions and services, social and behavioral sciences and psychology, and STEM science, technology, engineering, and math. And I use a little technique here where the distribution is the box and whisker, and the blue diamond is my school. So you can look here and see, well, my, our peer institutions are pretty nicely distributed, about 20% for business and communication, and we're pretty high. We're above the 75th percentile. Education, the other institutions, not too big. We're really high in education. We're the top. We're the, out, we're the maximum. Humanities and fine arts, a little above the average. Life, health, sciences, low. Public health, professional services, high. Social behavior, sciences, low. And off the charts, low on STEM. We don't have engineering, or we didn't until last year. You can ask later if you really want to know what that's about. Anyway, this is a very good way to, A, compare distributions on variables that are distributed. So. 
these two are kind of the same in the population in terms of distribution, a little less, a um, little more variation in the center, or a little clustered to the center. Not with, but this is very different from that, and so on. So you get to see how the distributions compare. This has probably the most variation going from our 5% to someone at 40% of their degrees. Now we have the classic correlation. This is interval ratio against interval ratio. This is something you would expect to be related, weight and height. Does this tell you that it's causal? Does weight cause height or does height cause weight? No, but you, you think it's a spurious correlation. There's something going into both. But you do have tall, thin people, and you do have short, hefty people. However, overall, th the correlation looks like that in this particular sample. So now let's look at the correlation between students' entry metric points and their first year marks. So get in your mind how you think it'll look compared to this one. Will it be tighter or will it be more scattered? You got it? Got the picture? There's the actual distribution. So as you can see, there's very little. Well, I mean, the regression line is, is um, not too bad. It shows it. But the R square, which is at the top, is 0.06. So 6% of the variation in grades is, is um, accounted for by entry matriculation points. So um, obviously, it's not that close. How students do their first year is only modestly, I mean, not a, hardly related to their high, school, their high school or secondary school metric points. OK. Um, I didn't say much about ordinal, you notice, because it's kind of a special case. On the one hand, at the basic level, you treat it more like a nominal variable, but there's a little more you can do. Um, you're not supposed to show averages. You could talk about the percentage that are agree or higher, agree or strongly agree. Sometimes you pool, you can pool group, groups that are next to each other because it's ordinal. Those are higher than the ones below. Um, Averages, not so cool. But what psychologists like to do is ask you like 10 of them, 10 Likert scale questions, and then score you across them and create a scale. And as long as that scale has good internal reliability with a measure like Cronbach's alpha, they say we can treat it like an interval ratio scale. And a lot of psychological science, social psychological science, is based on, uses that. Um, other people disagree with that, but then again, you know what people in one discipline tend to think about the epistemology of people in another discipline. One thing with the ordinal is you must keep the variables in their order. You can't say uh, disagree, strongly agree, um, strongly disagree, neutral, you know, that would make no sense. You've got to have them in the right order. What about your data? What are some of your key variables and, and what are their characteristics? So anyone give me something from your data? What is your core outcome, let's say? Core yeah, what, what, are you, what are you looking at in terms of, you know, what, what are you studying? What's, what's the, tar the focus of your study? Uh, okay, <coughs> several reasons. Okay, alcohol, if alcohol is causing infertility, Okay, so in infertility males. is yeah. the outcome. Yeah. Yes, infertility is the outcome. Okay, and alcohol consumption is the predictor. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so how do you measure infertility? Uh, well, are they able to have children after 12 years of um, sexually unprotected sexual intercourse? So what kind of variable is it? What's, what's the values it can take? What's the value? Yeah, what could a, a given person, what could their value be? What's their mark? What's a mark? Yeah, well, how do you code the person? How okay, you yeah, you can look at, okay, one year, 12, 12, year, 12 months. And if they had a kid? If they had a kid, okay, and um, now they, don't, they are not able to have any more after having the first kid, so they have um, a secondary infertility. Okay. They're no longer having a primary infertility. So it's either yes or no. Yeah. Okay. It's a dichotomous variable. 
Okay. What about alcohol consumption? Okay. Now, alcohol consumption, you can go into um, how, how much of alcohol do they consume? Okay. Um, so what kind of alcohol? Of is it beer, the, con the spirits, uh, wine? So what? that's what they do. That's, that's kind of qualitative, what they drink. Okay. And how much they drink. And how much they drink. quantitative. Yeah. It could be ratio, like how many drinks per week. Zero is meaningful. Okay. Ten is twice as many as five. So that's an interval ratio variable, and your outcome is a dichotomous variable. Okay. So you could look at what? What statistics are valid? Mm, not sure. <laughs> Anyone want to offer? Yeah. The outcome uh, in my own is I'm working on exchange rate and domestic prices. So exchange rate is the outcome. Domestic prices is a predictor. And what are their scales? Uh, the skills uh, I'm looking at, uh, this is they are all secondary data. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm measuring using uh, uh, ARDL. So it's debt, debt level? Or it's a, what, your outcome variable is it dollars? Dollars, yes. Okay, and so that dollars are discrete, countable interval numbers. You can break them down to the penny, but you can't go any finer. No, I... Whatever you call. Okay, I use this, um, the exchange rate of dollars to the domestic uh, uh, currency of each country in the sample. Okay. And what's that? That's a scale. It's a it? scale. It's a scale. What's because, its values? Well, what, what values can it take? It can take from uh, zero to as high as maybe depending on the fluctuations of inflation in the domain in the country. Uh -huh. And that's, it's a scale, it's a scale. Uh, so it's measure. a continuous variable. Con yeah. Con something, it's interval ratio one way or another. Yeah, it's continuous. Okay. So you can correlate the two. You can't, you have to do a group difference. What's the average alcohol consumption among fertile and in versus infertile men? So you have a dichotomous variable and then you can look at the distribution or the types of alcohol they consume, that would be more of a cross tab, but the average consumption, the quantitative number, you'd have a group difference. Um, so those are the kind of things you think about when you're doing it. Sometimes it's, it's kind of so intuitive, it's sort of like when you speak your language, you don't think of your grammar. And sometimes when you're looking at these, like you would have known to do look at the group difference. I didn't have to tell you it, but now I'm putting it in a framework that tells you why it has to be a group difference. Now that I've told you all the rules, I'll tell you how you break them or why you break them. So, for example, there's a, um, a technique called logistical regression, which predicts a binary outcome. So even though it's nominal, you can use a regression technique because you transform the variable from a binary one to a log odds ratio. The log of the, per, the probability that'll happen over the probability that it won't happen, and you take the log of both, and that's what you're predicting, and you've created a continuous variable out of a, a binary variable. Uh, similarly, there's a, a lot of ways we will transform data. When you're looking at, I don't know about the Gini index, but when you're looking at income, you generally have to do a log transformation because it's very skewed. Very few people make a very lot of money. And though they bring the average way up, whereas if you look at the median, it's actually much lower. So sometimes people do transformations on them. So there's a lot behind this. And again, we're not, we're, we're making sure you're aware of these differences. So as you go and start to use them, you then say, oh, I better look at what kind of statistics I can do given the type of measure I have, or how I might change my type of measure so I could do other types of statistics. Okay, that's enough on, on types of variables, but if you have any, if you have any questions or thoughts on types of variables. Okay, let's move over to data sources. Um, <clears throat> one of the most important for the kind of work many of us do where it's embedded within an institution, higher education, um, hospitals, 
in particular, but then with things like climate change, there are extant national data sources, so the data is kept somewhere, is what kind of data are they? And perhaps the biggest distinction to be aware of is this transactional versus analytical. I threw in textual as kind of a different source because sometimes people keep text data differently than they keep the, the coded data. They keep them in files, you know, in um, file repositories, not in data repositories. Sometimes they put them in file repositories. They break the data up and enter it. But often it's a different kind of data. It's documents. Documents are stored differently. More and more universities are moving to document repositories that allow us to do an analysis of documents in the repositories. The archives have always been that way, but now the archives tend to be more digital than ever before. So the transactional is the stuff that gets captured on the day-to-day -day operations of the organization um, or gets captured in the day-to-day -day monitoring of weather, whatever it is. It's, it's a very much of a changing thing and it's constantly moving. And so if you look at a day on this day and you do an analysis and you come back three days later and do an analysis, you actually have different data and things may change. There's a big distinction within them between these days, this is where the big data comes in, between the unidirectional and the multidirectional systems. A unidirectional system is like your student information system, your patient record system. Someone is putting in the data and that's what determines what the data are, that one person's actions to put in the data. You know, they may be doing it right or wrong, that's another matter, but basically there's a system, you put the data in, it means this. With social networks and course management systems, multiple actors are putting in the data at the same time. So let's take a course management system. Many of you use that. You can't just go into every course of a course management system and pull the data out for the student behavior and say it's the same over the different courses because it depends how the instructor uses the system. If they're just posting their syllabus and calendar, that's one thing. If they're doing forum discussions and have online quizzes and online training materials, that's completely different. So what the data mean for one person in the system depends on how the other person uses the system, which is what makes it really complicated. In either of those cases, to do analysis, you have to pull the data out of the system, extract it. And if you're simply extracting it when you need it and then you do the analysis, you're going to come up with different answers depending on what day you do that. So now we create these analytical data systems, sometimes called the data warehouse, data mart, data cubes, all sorts of names for it, where we take the snapshots of the data in a very systematic, disciplined way. So for Financial things, it's usually monthly and yearly. A quarterly, monthly, yearly are the periods. For students, terms or semesters, whatever you call them. But there's often a distinction between a beginning of term extract and an end of term extract. So beginning of term, we tend to use here's our official enrollment. And we usually take it on the 7th or the 10th or the 20th day of the semester and say, boom. That's first term 2017 enrollment. And we can compare it to first term 2016 because we extracted it at the same time so it's comparable. So when you're setting up systems to do research, you have to think about that. What's my, what's my uh, schedule of extracts so I can get things to be comparable in some way? If I were to be looking at the admissions process at a university, I'd use the concept of week in cycle. So the admissions process opens here. And this is the first week, the second week, the third week, and then finally it closes when I stop taking any more applications. Usually you work backwards from there to say what week in the cycle it is. But then you have to remember to take a, a snapshot every week. Because if you want to compare next week to this year, you had to have captured that information. So that's the key of these ana analytical point-in-time extracts. The other things we can do is we can create derived variables, like I said about race ethnicity, based on how the student responds to a, are you Hispanic, yes or no, if not, or what race and, and their citizenship. We say, here's our field called derived ethnicity where we use the trumping rules. 
When we do our grades, we have certain business rules we use to determine, determine grade point average. When, I, I don't know what you have in hospital patient data, but I'm sure you have ways of taking pieces of data and coming up with a, uh, like an aggregate or a, a derived variable. Can you think of any, our hospital friends? Do you have like anything like recurrence or like recidivism that they have with uh, criminal systems, people coming back to the hospital? Yeah, recurrence. If you have it, that would be one. Um, Okay, relapse rate. So you have to find what you mean by that in terms of how much time it takes. So you might have a, you may check a year later to see, or you know, you have some sort of rules you use, definitions, so that you can have comparable measures. So those are examples of the kind of derived variables based on, in business, their business rules, but in research, their research rules. We also can geospatially code some of those data. If we have a place, we can say where it is so we can then relate the, um, like where our students are from to facts about where they're from at the time they came from it. So there's that kind of alignment of timing. So we talked about the different systems and this is good, this coded versus labeled versus full text. That's what we were struggling with where you have a variable and it says Q1, the value is Q1, and you have no idea what that means. That's a coded value. And it's, uh, um, you know, it's, they could put a label on it like quintile one, and maybe you'll get better understanding. But when you're analyzing data, you don't want the labels, you want the codes, because just the manipulation is too awkward if you have these long labels. So some people can use, uh, generally when you're working in statistical packages, you're using coded data but a statistical package lets you put what's called a value label on it so that it can apply the label when it does the output, but you're using the coding internally. Um, some people just like all, everything, college of agriculture and economic, whatever it is, AES, engineering and science. Some people, AES, that's all I need to know. I know exactly what you're talking about. So there are those kind of fine differences. Um, I did talk about the fact that coding tends to make you think something may be numerical when it's not numerical. Now, um, if you code female one and male two and calculate an average and get 1.49, you know, what does that tell you? Well, actually, if you coded zero and one and you get 0.49, it tells you that 49% of the people have the one value. So it actually does give you information if you do an average on a dichotomous variable, and that's why that's a, a funky variable. Um, folks using Excel, labels tend to be no problem. You can put it right in there. Your pivot charts will pick it up. Um, Reshma lied to you a bit about me showing you how to use pivot tables and all because that's, that's not part of this uh, session. But I actually will use pivot tables a little bit tomorrow when I look at the, um, um, when, I, when I take you through looking at some trend data. So if those of you, how many of you have used pivot tables? Not many. Okay. Well, you get to see what is perhaps one of the more um, easy to use forms for doing t tabular analysis these days. And Excel has it, and several other programs have it, but you'll, you'll maybe even start playing with that yourself. Okay. We talked about the different transactional and use, um, unidirectional systems, and this just further describes these are your typical unidirectional operational information systems at a university, and I threw in patient records for our friends in, um, you know, in hospitals. Of course, finance, space facilities, and research and human resources pretty much applies to any organization. So just know someone somewhere is keeping all this data. They keep entering it. They have... Um, data sets that have every building on campus, every room in every building, what the square footage is, what the, build, what the space is used for. I assume they have because we have it. They have all the student data, they have the human resource data and so on, and the finance data. Putting these together is um, not simple, but a university that has its analytical data act together will have that. Now we're suddenly getting into the course management system. That's a whole new frontier. 
Some of you may have used analytics on your course management system. Does anybody, do they even have it here? Right, but does, what uh, system do you use, Moodle? Does Moodle have any built-in analytics where you can look at when the students, how many students came in? It might, you'd be surprised. Most of these software have it. You just have to turn it on and you could look at how often students log in, what's the distribution of, they have it, okay. So they're starting to have these things and people are getting more and more into using some of these features to understand how students are doing. There's even people who are developing these little widgets that you can add in and you can connect your, your assignments to your assessments and you can look at how students doing in assessments doing their assignments and have little monitoring dashboards of where students are and the material and things like that. So it's, it's getting pretty um, sophisticated but it's even more complicated than analyzing just unidirectional data because of the fact that it's based on an interaction. Social networking platforms, now even people are moving more into that and scraping, I think they use that, data scraping, they use that term, pulling in from your social networking system. So for example, where, where do our students go? What are they doing? Where, where are they working? You can scrape social networking sites, LinkedIn and other places to find that out. And in fact, if you go to LinkedIn and, and type in University of KwaZulu-Natal, you'll probably get information about all the people in LinkedIn who are associated with the uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal by having, a, 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 having gotten a degree from there. Um, this we already talked about. Why does it feel like I'm going backwards? The only thing important on this one I want to add is the normalized versus flattened file idea. As Randir mentioned, you have this situation where you may have one file, like the student record, which tells you who the student is, where they're from, blah, blah, blah. And then you may have another file that says, says what courses they're taking. And so this is one record per student and this is multiple records per student. Well, our statistical software doesn't allow us to analyze data that is not flat, that's normalized, which is not really normalized, but it's more normalized. So we usually have to turn the multiple record data sideways and say, course one, what is it? What was the grade? Course two, what is it? You have to know how many possible courses could the, mo the student have taken in a semester? So you, you know, you, some people may have six, some people may have four, some people may have two. So you have these kind of bins, but that's called a flattened file. And you always end up with a flattened file when you're doing analysis, even though, well, depending on what kind of analysis, that these systems have these complicated structures with different files of different structures. So that's it. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to see, give you a chance to think about issues you're having with your data, with the data you're using. Um, like, have you come across problems? Have you been able, you know, do you feel you have it in the format you need it, coded the right way? Or are you just not there yet with defining your data set? How's it going? Any takers? You're all, no problem with your data. Raise your hand if you have a data set. Okay, so. Okay, let's ask it the other way. If you don't have a data set, what Raise. can we do to assist? Because you have to leave here today with a data set.